you are viewing Haley Shoji's screen. That's weird. James Hello, Orr. everyone. Welcome to Night School with Helen Smith, our guest of honor this evening. Um, I see so many familiar faces. It's great to see everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Haley Shoji. I am the Alumni Relations Manager at PACE and also a graduate uh, class of 2012. Um, we are here tonight for about an hour's worth of presentation from Ms. Smith, going over some of the things that have changed in her five decades at PACE. And then we are gonna have some time for Q&A at the end. And I ask that you stay muted just so that Ms. Smith can do her presentation uninterrupted, but please, I see lots of people in the chat box already, please continue to use the chat box to interact with Ms. Smith as well as each other. And then at the end, when we do the Q&A, you can unmute yourself and ask her your question, but we will do a little bit of a, we will call on you for lack of a better word. And um, we will have a time for a few questions and then we're going to get everyone on with their evening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to the person you really wanna hear from, Miss Helen Smith. Good evening, everybody. This is so exciting. And you're all adults. I don't even know how to act. Um, I'm very excited because signed up for tonight is one person from my first graduating class, 1973, and one person from the most recent graduating class, 2020. So this makes me very happy. Thank you for doing this. Um, we're going to start this evening, and I suppose you're really not surprised with this. We're going to start with a little quiz. And so Haley is in charge of this, and she will now take over, and she will do this. So thank goodness she's doing the technology. <laughs> okay, everyone. So you should see a poll up on your screen. Um, please select which decade you were in at PACE, along with um, which of the very many famous Helen Smith sayings you remember hearing. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to let everyone participate and then I will show you the answers. <laughs> okay, we're at about 60% of you guys have answered, so we'll give it a few more people before ending the poll. And we have some very clear winners in the, in the classic Helen Smith sayings. Okay, last chance to get your answer in. And here are our results. So we have pretty good distribution amongst classes. And is anyone surprised that the number one saying they remember miss this saying is don't be a sleaze? Because I'm not. Okay. I'm actually hurt. Um, but that's part of being a teacher. Um, <laughs> the last one. Thank you for your patience, effort, and patience with my lack of technology expertise and help. Those of you who have been in my class for the last five years, you should know that. It has been a constant nightmare and you have really, really helped me survive it. And one of the ones that she didn't put in here because it was too long a list was my favorite saying, which led Cindy Gay to say that I must have been taken over by some strange spirit is, oh, I'm sorry you had a late game. You may take the test sometime when it's convenient for you. Or, oh, you didn't feel well. 
okay, we'll let you make that up some other time. I actually do that, you guys. I mean, this is unbelievable. It is not the same person you know. Okay, thank you. And thank you for being here. I really appreciate this. I need to, now how do I get rid, okay, can you see my, on the screen, can you see the poll? Can you see my screen? We can see your screen, but not the poll. That's good, okay. So far, so good. Okay, now, um, first of all, greetings. I've already said that. Now, I want to thank everybody in this group who helped last year when Pace revealed how old I really am to the world. That was really, really nice. I am more than three quarters of a century old and you all have been a part of really almost two thirds of that time. That's good. I also want to thank those of you who continue to send Christmas cards. Um, I am slower at replying to Christmas cards than I was or am in turning back papers. So I really appreciate the fact that you keep in touch. It means a lot. Okay, this is, as you can see, a little bit of what I hope to do tonight. And you know about my classes, they never go the way we think they will. And so here we start. We're going to look at two things tonight. We're going to look at sort of what we teach and I'm honing in on two really specific things. The other thing that we will do is we're going to look at how the teaching and the curriculum have changed. And I thought I would start because most of you in this group have been in AP history, or if you haven't, then you've been in 10th grade history. And that means that you covered very much of the same material. But I thought I would notice that in the 1970s, in 1972, if you took AP, you had 100 multiple choice questions and two 45 minute essays, one of six. And these were questions like, was the 30 years war more a result of politics, religion, or economics? Or to what extent did the French Revolution act as a catalyst, oh, we would have never used that big word then. To what extent did the French Revolution lead to permanent changes in French government structure? That was a good one. Uh, that's all you had to do. You had to memorize enough that you could answer 100 multiple choice questions and write two essays, two out of six. Now, by the time we get to the 21st century, one of the major things that to me is so fascinating is we draw on lots of disciplines. And I think this is really cool because it helps emphasize the fact that history is not just political and it's not just international relations. It is history. It should be herstory, but it is a story of human beings and what we have done. And that's why it has to include all of these different kinds of topics. Now, I have some caveats that I would like to uh, give right now. Um, many of you know so much more than I do about anything I'm going to talk about, and I appreciate that. Um, I realized as I started to work on this that my knowledge is about one centimeter thick, but the best and most wonderful thing about teaching is, teaching in high school, is you get to explore so much and learn so much about so many things. There is no depth, but that's okay because your students can graduate and they can have the depth of understanding. So we'll now begin. We're going to start with curriculum and I'm going to do this really fast. I'm not going to read everything that's here, um, but I wanted you to know that we do change with the times, despite the fact that we still teach American history, in 11th grade, that we still teach 10th grade European history, we've added some things. This is this list right here in the middle. And some of you starting in the 1980s had comparative politics. Many of you had art history with Miss Sibley and then uh, with Mr. Horner. And we've added world history. We finally have admitted that someplace other than Europe and the United States actually exist on this globe. 
Now, we also have some specialty topics, Black history, women's history. We had a geography AP class. We're doing economics as part of the history department, uh, comparative religions. All of these are good because these allow students to explore their interests and to go into much more depth than we did earlier. Now, the other major thing, I were here on the left, I have here the themes from AP European history. And all of you who were in my class probably remember pies, political, intellectual, economic, and social. Or sometimes it was peers because we added religion. Or sometimes we added primes because we added military. Or sometimes it was gripes because we actually talked about geography, you know, like rivers and mountains and like Napoleon had to go over mountains at one point. This is the deal. We actually mentioned other things, but now we're interested in interaction of Europe and the world. And two that we're going to talk more about tonight, national and European identity. We're not gonna talk about it as much as I want, but we'll talk about it. And we're also going to talk more about social organization because so much of this topic is what seems to me to be in our lives today, the issues that face not just this country, but around the world. The last one I love, technological and scientific innovation. We always did that as a part of intellectual history. Now we're not. Now we're really looking at it separately. And this is a syllabus from AP. The other thing I want to notice is an emphasis on skills and essay writing and argumentation. This is particularly in the comparative politics class because um, you have to write argumentation essays on the AP exam. That's a big deal. And some of you've learned to argue very well. Um, that was some of the skills that many of you had. Okay, now I'm gonna start with something that you all know. As I'm looking at what has shaped the PACE curriculum other than changes in our society and changes in teacher interest, we also, I decided have to look at three that we see here at PACE every day. And so I'm starting the first one here with globalization. And this, this chart is a little bit like my mind, it's fuzzy, but I think it's pretty good in the sense that we have the first age of globalization, we have the what I regard as the second age of globalization, and then they have subdivided this in to later ages of globalization. And in these, I actually talked about in class that this was a time period after the, the globalization 1.1 was after the industrial revolution, moving to uh, an, an industrial kind of financing, um, a new kind of economic system in the world um, that, um, we, that we moved here, I think much more to the United States taking a formal role in the world instead of trying to withdraw as we did after World War I. And then we certainly come into the technological revolution by this time. And I'm not sure where we're going now, but I like the picture of the brain. Um, now, globalization at pace. I think most of you know because you religiously read the magazines and the information that come to you from pace, we have student travel, we have the ICGL, and teachers and students do a lot on their own in terms of studying major topics. We have studied in Atlanta, we have discovered neighborhoods, we have looked at health issues, we have looked at factories, we have looked at sanitation plants. We do things that take us out into Atlanta we don't do it as much as we should. That's all I can say. This is such a rich resource and we need to do more. The next thing that I think is more important or is as important is our student and parent, parent population. We are much more diverse and this is in every possible way, including international origins of students, parents and students who have lived and worked overseas. And it really is a community in which when you travel, you can find someone from PACE. To make it even better for those of you who've been in Model UN and in our exchange programs, first with our sister schools in England and Japan, 
and Korea, which some of you have taken part in, you still are in contact with those people. To me, this is a community of the, I'm going to use the word privileged classes around the world. I keep saying to people in Model UN, we are part of an international elite and the ties that you make now are so, so important for you and for the future of this world that we share. The last thing I have here is curriculum. Notice the word world, world history, much more world literature. And interestingly enough, and I don't know if the purists approve of this or not, but we no longer teach French literature or Spanish literature. Instead, we teach the language. And that involves a lot of reading in the language and a lot of current events and current topics. So in this sense, we are somehow entering the 21st century. Okay. Now, oops, I forgot. You are supposed to use the chat function right now. Please enter your definition of the term Luddite. Now, wait a minute. I can't see the chat box. How do I? Oh. Right there. It's up here under more. Oh. And then chat. Chat. There you go. Technology is such a mystery to me. It's... Now you can see everyone. Okay. Oh, wow. This is great. I'm seeing everybody's name. Oh, this is so much fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys do know what a Luddite is. Okay, you all passed the course. Um, the reason that I wanted to do that is, now how do I get rid of this stupid thing? Can you see it on the screen? Yay, okay. Okay, group, here we go. I put this picture in because I am a Luddite and I couldn't get by without the students and the people at PACE when it comes to computers. And I put in this woman in Wikipedia because true confessions, sometimes I go to Wikipedia and don't we all, it's a dirty little secret. Okay, you need to know about technology for those of you who don't have students here, we are not a laptop school. I want to remind you a little walk in the past. Bob Chambers once said, Helen Smith will never ever use a computer. Well, he was wrong, but he shaped us, all of us who had him as principal in so many important ways. I'm sure you remember Mr. Ioannidis and his Volkswagen bus van, Volkswagen van in which he carried people to school and explained to us that math had the meaning of life totality. Jim Dietz, and then today we have some of the most wonderful IT people in the world. And what I love is they give us access to scholarly journals. Now, the other thing that I really love is that, as you can imagine, if you're a parent, your students know so much more than you will ever know about computers. They know so much more than your teachers. And wait a minute, sometimes they and the computer people actually work on the same problems. We have two uh, advanced placement computer programs. We have an e-sports team. These are all really cool. Now, let me notice here or point out to you for people in Model UN, we love the fact that many of our topics in Model UN concern the very questions that are raised here under ethics. We think that this is really important. That's what I mean by technology. You see the problems that I talk about. The next thing, neuroscience. I didn't know that there was a a field of study called educational neuroscience, but there is, and this is important. 
And we are finally beginning to incorporate this. We are trying to change the way that we teach to reflect the changes in our society and the changes in the expectations of our students, both the expectations they have for themselves and the expectations that their parents have for them and the pressures that science, I'm sorry, that society puts on them. Now, I want you to notice, and to me, this is the most important thing on here, how easily we are distracted and how short our attention spans are. You all know that. Now, I'm not going to read these um, slides to you. I put them on here so you don't have to listen to me. It's like looking at the posters in my room. If you're not interested, read the slide, okay? We're now going to have a quiz. This is another quiz in which you have to fill in the blank. Because one of the major themes in history is always how does change take place over time? I want you to enter your answers to these questions. It's very clear, it's on here. I want you from your point of view to answer this question, what has changed most in the world around you starting say after high school graduation until now and what has changed the most in your family. And uh, Haley and Andrew Guest who've helped me have suggested that I give my examples. So my examples number one for the world, there's no USSR. Um, I can remember sometime in the 1980s, actually driving home and pulling off beside the road when I was listening to the radio and thinking, oh my gosh, we really could use a nuclear bomb. I don't think that anymore. Now I think about non-state actors. I think about terrorists. I think about climate. Well, I think about a lot of things. Um, the next major thing that's changed the most for me is this global questioning or even an attack on what I regard as the basic values and principles that come out of 19th century classical liberalism. That does not mean liberalism as the dirty word, which was often used here at Pace uh, when I first came to school because everybody assumed that because I was in 1972 for George McGovern, that I was certainly a dangerous liberal, probably a socialist and possibly even a communist. And Mr. Kirkpatrick shared that vision. The second question, what has changed most in your family? And what I said is families are scattered around the country and around the world. My friends here in Atlanta are my family and my own community building is so important. Now, by this time, you probably have had time to enter this into the chat. And so um, if you would do that, will be interested in what you're saying. Lots of great answers around communication and technology, both for question one and two, and how that's affected their lives. A lot about, you know, having children and growth of families. Too much information too fast is an interesting theme that I'm noticing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And an engagement, congratulations. Mm. Mm, the rise of China. That was on the news as I was writing, as I was driving in tonight. It seems to be summed up in communication differences and growth of families. Mm -hmm. This is so interesting. Haley, do I get to see these answers later? Yes. Oh, this is so exciting. Okay. Okay, we're now going to move on from the introductory part. I guess I should look at my watch once in a while. Um, and we're going to now start with a topic that goes way, way, way back in history. 
And this is one that I mentioned, I think, when I discussed with Haley what I wanted to do. And I was trying to think of what is something that is so absolutely new in the 1970s or in the 1980s. And we may have mentioned, and I'll start over here on this side, the Little Ice Age. We can't even decide on the dates of the Little Ice Age. I just, these are some, just when I Googled it, these were in the first five um, um, entries that I saw. We may have talked about that in the 14th century crisis, but I think that's really it. Now you notice here that as I'm looking at crisis, I'm looking at this book, which has turned out to be a book I've never finished, but which I will read chapters at one time. 907 pages, three pounds, fantastic book. And what it does, it's global history in the best sense of it. It is global history. And he does not make this statement that the crisis is the result of climate change. And I love this quotation because this is a warning to every single historian and to every one of us who tries to make an argument. We have to decide, and sometimes we don't know for sure, believe it or not, is it cause or is it correlation? This statement, we must not paint bullseyes around bullet holes. That to me is absolutely key. I think that one of the reasons that I like to use crisis, the global crisis and the climate crisis as a hook is because it's something that all of the students are interested in. And we've all, as I've said, we've always used it in the 14th century. And I want to put one more quote here. Some, I decided this page looked like your notes after I had finished my so-called lectures or at the end of the class period. No order, no definition, no key points, just a lot of information, but this is important that the questions that we ask have to come from our own experiences. Okay, so we'll now move on. Now, I'm doing this to show you uh, several things because both the comparative politics class and European history require a lot more thinking than they used to, and also so does our society. Um, for example, we do a lot with interpreting uh, charts and graphs. I love this graph because, and well, first of all, because it shows the variety of sources down here and the dates of the information. It's great questions. You can do this with any age student. Why are there so many different lines? And then, and I don't know what the next question is because I can't see it. Um, okay, what, uh, third question, how do researchers learn? So this draws on their general knowledge. It makes them think, and above all, it makes them not just write down an answer that the teacher has given them. It asks them to use what they know and to build on it or to incorporate what their classmates know and build on that. And this fits so well with the active learning that we have to do in the 21st century if we're going to prepare our students for more than just to be little Googleites. Okay. Now, and the last question, why do historians care? That's great because a lot of them know a lot about current events. The next chart, this I love because it relates history to climate. And here we get declines in population. Here we get declines in population for the Justinian plague, which many of you remember. We actually used to teach medieval history for those of you who um, have now graduated from Pace, moving straight from Greece and Rome to the Renaissance, pretending that a whole thousand years of history did not even exist. Most of the institutions of Western civilization were established then, but of course, we just are going to deal with only the secular paganistic Renaissance and the classical age. I don't get it, but anyway, that was an editorial remark. Okay, now this next one, the Black Death, and then this great big one, the population loss of indigenous people 
because of the Colombian exchange. You guys, this is another word that we didn't even use in the 1970s. I don't even know when I started using it. The book was first used, or the term was first used in 1972 in the book by Crosley, but uh, we certainly didn't use it then. And the other thing that I had never thought about is so cool over here in the right-hand column, temperature declines in the early 1500s all over North America, like here and Northern Europe, have been traced to the trees regrowing on land that had formerly been farmed that Europeans were taking over and were not yet farming again because the trees were removing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I love these correlations and I love getting kids to look beyond what's obvious. This next one, very quickly, I just thought I would show you this. And the last thing I used the, uh, the, the idea of the hockey stick, uh, to, the shape of the hockey stick to show the change. And what I wanted students to do here is to look at this and to see and ask them, which one makes the changes more clear? First, we have to decide that the blue is yes, it's getting colder and the red yes, is getting warmer. Um, this is a great, great way to start student discussion and figure out what, oh, it's called metacognition. How do they learn and how do they think? Okay, the last one almost, demography. And here we're making relation, the relationship between um, population and climate. Um, and of course, if we were doing it this year, we would have talked about extremes of climate like the fires and the hurricanes. And, but I also find it fascinating is to look at the graphs. And I, I love this one because this one shows you in one small, small area of Italy. And I think that that is, I think that's really important for them to realize and to learn that historians are putting together evidence from small pieces of information, church records, or if the city did a census, and to realize that this is not just something that appears in a bound textbook. Somebody has to find the information. Last page right here. Uh, I love using sources other than the written word in a textbook. This is the 14th century crisis. This over here is the 17th century crisis. This one, uh, you don't need to know a lot about, you don't have, will not be quizzed on this, but isn't this the coolest picture? Because this is from the divine comedy, the Inferno. And um, in case you can't read the words, I was going to read this. Dante, I am in the third circle filled with cold, unending, heavy, and accursed rain. Its measure and its kind are never changed. Gross hailstones, water gray with filth, and now come streaking down across the shadowed air. The earth, as it receives that shower, stinks. And we have our great beast. This is just fantastic. The next one. We, I love Dutch painting, here it is, or um, this is the perfect 17th century crisis, climate change. And this one is even better because this one shows the ship stuck here in the ice. You can see the people ice skating here and this is be just a little local port. They're unloading peat. Oh, it tells you that they're unloading peat here. But the thing that's important that I didn't really realize is that even though the Spanish probably were going to lose anyway, that the climate may have made a difference here because the defenders, the Dutch, the Northern provinces of what had been the uh, Spanish Netherlands were in towns. Now that means that they could be cut off from supplies at times, but the Dutch seemed to be able to manage that fairly well. But the soldiers were out in the cold and they could not get supplies easily and they were often cut off from their supply lines. And all of this helped lead to the uh, success of the Dutch in getting their independence. 
I just think that this is so fantastic for us. And then I want to remind you of some things you probably remember. French Revolution, major drought, 1787 to 88. French Revolution in 1848, droughts 1846 and 1847. Today, as the Sahara Desert extends into what used to be the very northern part of Nigeria, now way down into the center to intense ethnic rivalries and clashes in the middle belt. And that's happening all over that zone in, um, in Central Africa. Syria's drought started before Arab Spring in 2011 and farmers all over Syria watched their animals die. The ground became cracked they went to cities. There was no way for the cities to absorb them. They didn't have skills. That was it. Then you get the spark of the beginning of the Arab Spring and well, you see where we are today with Syria. Southeast Asia, droughts right now. And one, one that affects us every day is the changing ecosystem and climate change in Central America, which is leading to a vast migration. And you understand that that's become a major political issue. Okay, we are now going to go on to something else. We're going to start looking at these themes. And out of these two themes from this uh, outline that I showed you earlier, all we're going to look at today really is class, for social organization, and we're going to look at identity. Now, what's even more interesting to me, but I couldn't do it all, was to look at uh, the effects. Because notice, we often spend too much time, I think in history classes, looking at what happened and why it happened. But I think the fact that we now are looking more at effects is really important. And you see that I am caught up here in a paradigm in which I learned history. We didn't do as much as looking at the long-term results in individual and society or on political, social, and cultural order. Uh, we were very perfunctory in our looking at results. Now, I have to confess, there's one topic that was mentioned that I thought we would do. It was the quotation about women holding up half the sky. Well, history lives left out women for thousands of years, and it's Women's History Month. I should have covered women, and we really are not, and I'm sorry. Now, what you see here are some words that we did not use. We did not use these at all. Um, in European history, when I was teaching, I have no idea for how long until we, except for these, power, authority, hierarchy, and patriarchy. And I've put in here the definitions that we now use because these are very much political science definitions that we get, for example, in comparative politics. Um, we have uh, Max Weber um, discussing the different kinds of uh, legitimacy um, or authority and legitimacy really. And these are very interesting words to use now as we look at the changes going on today around the world. Um, so I thought I would mention that we are working more together. I've said this already, and we are working more on definitions, the clarity of definitions, which of course is pretty much impossible. Um, the next topic I want to talk about now is talk about identity. And we're going to look at identity in three different ways, three different levels. We're going to look a little bit at individual identity, at nationalism, the national identity, and the development of that. And this will be a review. If you're a history professor, if you're a political science teacher, if you're a lawyer who studied all this in college, I just apologize. Um, but here it is anyway. So we're going to do individual, nation, and then a little teeny look at the world system. Now, when I started to look up the term identity, um, I found this great project uh, in Swedish University. It's called the uh, History and Identity Project, in which 
their introductory pro introductory page to the program says, why is the Western world preoccupied with identity? I don't have a clue, except maybe we've lost it. I'm not sure. But the other point really got my attention. Until the scientific and psychological research in the mid 20th century, identity meant sameness or unchanged over time. And my immediate response was, huh? Wait a minute. We talked about the self. We talked about the individual. We talked about writing autobiographies in Renaissance. We talked about self-portraits. This is, I have to find out more about this. This is really interesting as to why they would say that. And I'm guessing it has a lot to do with the human mind and with our advances in psychology. But I did like this, and I thought this would be so good to use with students, that we have two different kinds of identity, according to this university panel. We have our internal identity, and we have our external. And the stress that's created between those two, well, you know the stress that we all have, that your children have, that your grandchildren have, that your friends and neighbors have, especially in the last year. So I would certainly use that in the classroom. Now, the term intersectionality, a word I had never used, and I think you're all aware of the fact that we use that word so much today, particularly as we're talking about um, one of the major issues facing our society, uh, racism. Today, I'm looking at it here, and I am at least talking about two women because I love these. I hope you remember them from European history. Uh, Christine de Passan, um, it was a picture of her as a woman, as a late medieval woman scholar in the classroom for probably most of my teaching career. Uh, and I wanted to look at the different categories she fit into when we look at people that are marginalized. She was an immigrant, okay, she was upper class. She was a married woman and then became a female. The law discriminated against her. She finally did get her inheritance. It was long, it was expensive, um, and she was never sure she was going to win. She studied, she purposely studied the classics. She studied science. She wanted to be a learned person. And she said in her book, The City of Ladies, if women had written these books, their image would be that of intelligence and strength. But she also is recognized for another kind of identity, for speaking about a strong French woman, Joan of Arc. And I really love this description. One of the West's first feminists, first professional writers, the first woman that we know who totally made her living from writing, except for the money she got from the inheritance, which wasn't a lot. And one of the first vernacular authors who oversaw the illustration of her books. And if you think of your favorite children's books, think of the books and the authors and the illustrators who make those books so special to you and to them. Okay, Flora Tristan, dangerous woman. First of all, mixed heritage, uh, French and Peruvian. Her father was wealthy. When he died, she couldn't inherit. When she moved to Paris from Peru, where she lived and wrote travel uh, descriptions for almost a decade, she was working class. She married. Her husband shot her because she was interested in women's rights and workers' rights. She even had trouble getting a divorce from this man. Her thought is important because she rejected the utopian socialist idea that workers could improve within the existing society. And she said workers had to take charge of their own lives. And I think it's interesting to see here these two words that are so important. Both of these women had agency. Both of them made decisions. Both of them went through the legal system and they both voiced an opinion that was opposed to the status quo. And this I think is really important. 
but one of the things that I think is important if we had had time to do women's history is we would have talked about the fact that we used to talk about individual women, women who stood out because they were upper class or they were rulers or they were intellectuals. Or Today, we talk about women and we never can talk about women as a whole, but we can talk about women who are aware of themselves as a part of a group and who succeed partly because of the efforts of those who have gone before them. Now, I love this chart. Intersectionality, there's a definition over here from the source. What I loved about this when I read it, and incidentally, just for fun, if you actually had an announcement of your wedding in the New York Times style section, I probably have a copy of that folded up in my drawer that someone will clean out when I die and they'll wonder why I have these. Um, this privilege group sounds like the New York Times trial, uh, uh, style section. And one of the things that I do that I realize so much here at Pace is we all are part of a privileged community. We have been and we continue to be. And I really liked looking at this group of marginalized groups within here, all of which you recognize. And this is not saying that these people do not become privileged. We know that there are people in every one of these groups who do. And we're talking here about groups. We're not talking about individuals. And I think it's really important for us to see the way that we relate to other people. Those of you who've traveled with me, particularly in the last 15 or 20 years, know that I remind students all the time, we are so lucky. Please thank your parents. Please appreciate the fact that the airline upgraded you out of the cattle car in the back. This is all important for us to know who we are and to be aware of our privilege. Now, let me go ahead. We're going to go on to national identity. And I found this chart that I really liked because when we talk about a nation state, I put these definitions over here. Um, these are from just political science textbooks, just a synthesis. Um, when I put these over here, I, one of the things that I thought was really important is that for a long time, we, in history, we didn't really talk about the difference between an ethnic state and a civic state, and obviously the lines blur here, tre tremendous, nothing is separate. But what I think is interesting is this one right here, because this describes what the United States really is, a civic state unified by its institutions, its values, its expectation of political behavior and norms, its traditions. It unites people who are not from a common ethnic, religious, racial background into a state. And I guess the thing that to me is important, and I'll certainly be using this in comparative politics next year, is to think about where our countries are now and to think about where they were in the past, because this is something that certainly is undergoing change right now. We talk about the concept of a nation state, and I think looking at these subdivisions is something that we didn't do and I think we need to do that. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all this. All I wanted to say is historians love to argue. I've been in elevators at the American Historical Association with Robert R.R. R. Palmer arguing with another historian about the French Revolution. Now this is pretty much the closest I can get to going to heaven here on earth is to be in the same elevator with R.R. R. Palmer. Now, there is one school of thought which looks at the idea of nationalism developing really early and talking about all these different examples of 
nations or people who are aware of their ethnic and cultural identities that are different from others. And also that even when they lived in the same place, lived under different laws. Now we all know from, uh, from our history, vernacular languages helped um, and the decline of Latin as the international language, um, international language of scholarship and law, medicine, as a decline of that, then helped divide us further. I did want to mention this one because, uh, well, just because of Israeli politics today, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's father was the, one of the historians who wrote, I think it was a thousand page book on the origins of the Inquisition and uh, in Spain. And he talked about the idea of seeing Jews in Spain, the conversos, not as a religious group, but seeing them as a race. And the theory is that the conversos were always suspected of not being true Christians, which they were theoretically supposed to be once they had converted. We all know about the Reformation and its encouragement of national um, languages and of separation from the Roman Catholic Church. But one of my favorites here is dynastic nationalism. And you all may remember Elizabeth I going to speak to her soldiers before this uh, arrival of the Spanish Armada, telling them that she may have, um, that, that she may be a woman, but she has the heart and soul of a man and that, that she is to defend the English nation. And I wish I could remember the precise quote, the dynastic nationalism, but we say it is the French Revolution, or this is what most historians say. And what I would like to mention here is something that I think is really important, which is the idea that in a way, nationalism becomes a religion and notice in the ways that it does it. I'm going to read some words from the Marseillaise. Maybe this will say something about the tension within the nationalism of the French Revolution. What does this horde of slaves, of traitors and conspiring kings want? For whom have these vile chains, these irons long been prepared? It is us they dare plan a return to the old slavery. Tremble, tyrants and traitors, the shame of all parties. Tremble. Everyone is a soldier to combat you. If they fall, our young heroes will be produced anew from the ground, ready to fight against you. To arms, to arms, to arms, to arms. And one of the most interesting things to me about nationalism this strong defense surrounded by enemies. But there's another idea that comes out of the French Revolution, and it is the idea of, of not fraternity as nationalism, but as brotherhood, as a community. And that goes to this definition up here of the modern state can mobilize people for an imagined community whose members develop a sense of obligation to one another. And then historians love to debate this topic. Did monarchs create or strengthen the nation or did they build a state around a nation? We don't have an answer, but I love the questions and the questions are what are most important. My very last thing here, quick change over time. Okay, you all remember this from 10th grade history that romanticism was both liberal and conservative. We have here Delacroix liberty leading the people. We have here the very conservative Chateaubriand, French um, romantic thinker in the, um, I'm sorry, uh, in the painting by uh, Caspar David Friedrich, uh, looking back to the history of France, to the religion, to the ancient mysteries, to the monks in the cold and the graveyard in the snow. It's wonderful. Romantics emphasize all of these things. And of course, it is such a small step from moving from 
uniqueness, to being special, to being superior. Remember that nationalism failed in 1848. It succeeded by war and by the 1870s, Italy, Germany, and the United States. There are lots of reasons that by the end of the 19th century, nationalism became what we saw first in World War I, one of the major causes, and then the ideology that drove Nazism in the Second World War. I would like for you to notice these other causes that people look at. Social Darwinism, the emphasis on power and survival of the fittest, again, superiority. Eugenics, we've had a great emphasis in eugenics here in this country as we've looked at the origins of racism. Um, I think that some of you might remember that, and I have this here as the last item here, um, a fairly recent book has discussed the impact of the laws and structures of our Jim Crow system on Nazi thought um, and Nazi practice once the Nazis were in power in Germany. You might, okay, anti-Semitism and the Dreyfus Affair. The Vienna mayor actually ran for office on a ticket called the anti-Semitic anti -Semitic ticket. Pogroms, the, uh, the fake protocols of the elders of Zion, much greater emphasis on groups. And this is that a whole thing. Now, Haley will now do our next poll. It's a multiple choice test. And we've just talked a little bit about nationalism and there are three questions here and the, Im and the images for questions two and three are on the screen. I have to hurry. Oh man, these people are smart. Since this is a multi-part poll, we'll give it a few more minutes just so everyone has a chance to read through and answer. So, um, so let's see, well, maybe we'll give it one more minute for everyone to get their answers in before I will share um, the results with you. I think you have final chance. They are doing very well. Yes, okay. And share. Yes, 50% got the first one right. 70% got the second one right. And I hadn't even read the answers. And 40% got the third one right. Okay, guys, good job. Now, the reason I showed you this is not because to test your knowledge, but I wanted you to see the different kinds of questions. Um, the questions that the older ones of you had to answer on the um, 
uh, AP exam were very much like that first one, just straight factual knowledge and memory. The other one, you had to use factual knowledge, but then you actually had to relate it and you had to think about a cause. Now, some people say, well, this means they graduate not knowing enough information. I'm not sure what to say about that because I think there's a framework of information, but at the same time, come on, you can Google to find out um, why, why the 1817 student revolt took place. So I'm always insecure about this, but I wanted you at least to see the example. Okay, now I'm watching the time and we're going to go on quickly now to identity. And I'm just going to mention here that everything changed. Nationalism, the new map of Europe in 1914, um, or sorry, after 1919, after World War I, an international vision. I think this is really interesting. Please remember that both Lenin and Wilson offered an international view. Then we know what happened. We know that the world then changed. Nationalism led to decolonization, and it finally led to the end of the Soviet Union, the second Russian empire to fall. Now, I wanted to mention some authors to you. Uh-oh, I, I covered up Samuel Huntington's name. We were so sure of ourselves in 19... 89, 90, and 91. Fukuyama said, we have ended the struggles of history. Liberal democracy and capitalism have won. And a more pessimistic note, Samuel Huntington came up with this map that said there, we are now moving away from a clash of nation states into a clash of cultures. And I just thought I would mention these because the two forces the two sentiments, two driving forces in the world today are globalization and fragmentation. And I thought I would mention these books. These are old. This tells you that I read old books or have read old books. Okay. Local, regional loyalties, global loyalties. Is the nation becoming less important? The last thing, oh, I was, oops, I have to hurry now. This was what I thought nationalism should be. These are from, Oh my gosh, these are from 1952, my first political convention. I love political conventions. I drove my family crazy. What seven-year-old should watch a political convention? And Stevenson, my hero, ran for two of them. And I love what Stevenson said about humanity and what nationalism is. This is the ideal that made me what I am. First of all, you should love this state. I mean, sorry, this map, just look at it. Look who voted for the Democrat. We notice there's been a change. Um, the one thing I want to say is this was also my experience with politics. Guess what, people? I ran Stevenson's campaign in my one-room schoolhouse. 12 votes. We went behind the easel and voted. Everybody promised me they would vote for Stevenson. When the votes were counted, there was one vote for Stevenson and 11 for Eisenhower. It was a bitter lesson. Okay, this is the Westphalian state system. Ms. Smith, I'm going to do a time check with you because we do have a lot of people that needed to jump off. Okay. If we're gonna have time for a Q&A, maybe one more slide. Okay, the Westphalian system has failed. Or oh, that's it? Well, wait, if I, <laughs> I can show you the next one. This failed and we get something else after the Second World War. The big thing I want to say is after the Second World War, sovereignty changed its definition. First of all, no longer did we have free and equal states. The five winners, and this is for maybe the great sentence to end on, winners write history. The five winners dominate the UN Security Council. Has it really failed? We haven't had a general war. Is that enough to mark it as a success? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, so we do have time for some questions. Um, and if what we're gonna, how we're gonna do this is if you have a question for Ms. Smith, if you would put your name in the chat box so that we can 
go in order because it's hard when you have a Zoom with so many participants. And we will have some time for maybe, let's aim for like 10 to 15 minutes of questions because we have to make sure we get Miss Smith out of here by 8.30. Um, so let's see, Ames has a question if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, hello, it's so good to see you. It's so good hey, to see I everyone. Oh my gosh, remember our Model UN trips? Very well, I almost said that. Uh, that oh my gosh, yes. Oh yes. I almost said that one phrase that I didn't see on the quiz was, remember, Model UN is about cooperation and learning, not about winning, which is a good reminder. Um, okay. But I, I have okay. two questions for you. Um, number one, I still remember the quote you had on your door about the First World War. Um, First World War, it came and it went, something along those lines. Um, do you have a favorite book about the First World War that's not Barbara Tuchman's? And number two, what do you think of the advent of history podcasters like Mike Duncan and Patrick Wyman, uh, people like that, if you've seen them or heard students talk about them. Um, and thank you. My, thank you, Ames. I'm so glad to see you. My favorite book about the First World War, and I can, I can see it on my shelf. Does this sound familiar? I can see it on my shelf. I know what color it is. I know what books it's next to. I can't remember the name, I could, but I can tell you, I can send it to you when I get home. Okay. Uh, podcast, you know, that's a technology. It's been a puzzle. I have listened to them. I am familiar with them. That's about all I can say. Uh, yes, actually, I approve of them. And but what I like even more is I like the visual thing. I've been doing, since I'm on leave this year and I'm only doing Model UN and not teaching any classes, it's been so much fun because I'm listening to history lectures and watching the lectures, the, the PowerPoints. I'm taking art history. It's just, it is just so fantastic. So I really haven't had time for podcasts, but I understand that I have a list a thousand miles long from my friends of ones I need to do. And I guess you like them. I think you'd really like revolutions. They're in the Russian Revolution right now, and uh, I've been listening to it and thinking, this must be a real kick out of this. Then you should write to me. You guys, I, I will. Really will answer emails, maybe faster than Christmas cards, much faster, OK? Um, so we have another question from Marianne. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Ms. Smith your question. Um, we're in Soviet history class. I was wondering, can we go on a field trip? Do you want to go to Russia? I, I went with you to the Soviet Union. I had I to go back to Russia. Oh, that's right. It was the Soviet Union. We are so old. I can't believe it. <laughs> Remember how- It was so weird going back. Have I've been back and it was so weird to go to Leningrad and then go to St. Petersburg. Yes, exactly. And remember how cold Leningrad was? Oh my gosh. Oh, and I just remember the people that were there were so scared of talking in a group to us. They were afraid they were gonna get arrested. Mm -hmm. And my favorite was Chris Adair and a bunch of the boys all stole those Russian army or traded for the Russian army jackets and tried to sneak them back in. And Chris put his in a girl's bag and then she, he had her bag and then they searched his bag and it was all girl stuff. <laughs> but we, and when we got back in the US, we were like, or in England, I guess, we were so excited that we made it through with those Russian army jackets or Soviet. I have never been as nervous as I was when one member of that group, was it Jeff Ellington, was taken back and searched and we no longer had someone who spoke Russian. I mean, because our in tourist guide had to leave us at the airport. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we had to go to KAX. That was our um, our uh, train station. But now I can say, and you know, spasiba. We needed that. We needed it. Okay, this is what great memories. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let's see. So, yes, I will share Miss Smith's email with you guys so you can uh, send her your, your book suggestions or podcast suggestions and she will eventually get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, but Mark Wilson has a question. Oh my goodness, Mark. <laughs> Good evening. I go, as people go down memory lane, I remember when you gave uh, Josh Grossberg and I detention because when we were the, uh, uh, I forget which country in the Middle East, we got up and 
because no one would agree to what we wanted, we decided the appropriate action was storming out of the room and we decided to leave early and go to Taco Bell for lunch. And you made us Djibouti. <laughs> hey, Josh. <laughs> um, oh, wow. I'm so happy Talk that you never forever. think like this. Yes. Uh, my question actually is, you know, one of the things I think has changed a lot, I'm starting to see this now that I am a high schooler myself, is that we used to live in textbooks. And with the advent of so many more ways to get access to information, what does the world look like in the class today? I mean, I can't imagine that they're hauling around, you know, three inch thick textbooks and memorizing from rote, especially given the way you go about teaching. How has that changed? And, you know, what's the, what's the trick to, to getting new uh, or old uh, innovative uh, pieces of information in front of students? Um, okay, we still use textbooks. Um, but I think that you can tell, well, I've always attacked textbooks. You may remember that, that I really don't like them um, and that I've always really wanted to do more with primary sources. One of the things that incidentally, for those of you who were so important in my classes, we don't have time to do the salon anymore. Um, one of my favorite things that we did was a long time ago, remember we had the advisory groups to uh, monarchs, like I had advisors to Philip II and advisors to Elizabeth, I can't remember who else, about what policies you should do. And you really had to do research because like you had to know what happened before the Spanish Armada because you were advising him what to do. I, people did costumes. I remember we did projects on the outbreak of World War I. We don't do that anymore, and I hate that. But Mark, what do we do? We do a lot of looking up, and we do a lot of typing answers quickly, like you guys did with the chat tonight. Um, in other words, it's to keep people involved, because I swear the attention span is so much shorter. But to me, it's um, like a signing, like for example, giving different primary sources to different people and having them um, respond to sources about the same event and very different points of view. It's that looking and evaluating evidence, L looking at the point of view, looking at the source. Um, I think that's much more important. I really like the fact that the new AP exam doesn't rely so much on memory of a lot of things. You have to know, I mean, if you don't know the Edict of Not and you don't know the Treaty of Westphalia, you can't get through, but you do not have to know about the names of all the families in the French wars of religion, or you do not have to know about the Bohemian phase of the, of the 30 years war. I mean, though, do you see, it's, a, it's that kind of difference and it's looking much more, I think, at themes and asking the questions of change and continuity and cause and correlation. And I th so what do we do? We use it all the time. We look at maps, we look at, we answer questions, uh, we look up historians' names. If I say, I can't remember who said that this was an Atlantic Revolution instead of a French Revolution. You know, somebody will look it up. And so for me, it's perfect because I can't remember anything. And so the kids can help me. So does that answer your question? It's just continually active. That's, I think that's the key. Not, wait a minute, they may not think it's active. From my point of view, it's active. <laughs> okay, the last call for any questions. Zach has a question. Um, hi, Ms. Smith, this is Zach Finch from, uh, I graduated in 1991. Um, wow, I'm I did not recognize anybody that I knew. Hi, oh my <laughs> gosh, okay. Um, so, yeah, I remember so much from your classes, including the section on, well, well, there was, we learned the history of Nigeria, then we learned the history of Israel and Palestine, and the Russian Revolution. Um, and, of course, your, your truth or truism that there, there's no black and white, just shades of gray. Um, my, my question for you is just about the student body. Like, I'm really curious. I mean, you, you mentioned that attention spans have shifted. Um, like in, in what other ways would you characterize the, the, the evolution or the change in, in, in the student body over the years? Um, students read less, no, not all students. Many students read less than they used to. Um, students are more stressed and their schedules are so busy. Part of it is resume building for college. Um, that to me is, just, is one of the really scary things. Um, 
because they don't read as much, uh, writing is not as mature and as insightful as it used to be, because we're used to looking for easy answers, as we've already said. That's, um, I think that's one of the, uh, the problems. Um, and several of you I noticed talking about uh, misinformation when you were talking about changes in your lives. That to me is really important, um, is helping the students figure out what are good sources of information. I think that's one of the, that's one of the key things that we can do. And um, like, for example, every single thing that I looked at, because there are lots of sources here I didn't know till I started to prepare this. I mean, I looked up to see what I could find out about the source. And particularly if you're writing research papers for me in comparative politics, you have to do that. So um, how has it changed? They're more worldly, they're more adult, um, they're more secular, they're more, I mean, I can, I can go on. Okay, um, but Haley, I'll, I looked at the clock. It's six. Okay, if I can leave here by eight thirty, I can. I can get home. Left, my, and I have, my, yeah, my I have questions. questions. Okay, so, so um, Wit, if you would like to unmute yourself. Yep. Hi, Miss Smith. It's okay. really great to see you. I'm so glad to see you. Yeah. So my question, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. You talked a lot about the importance of critical reasoning um, over memory in order to kind of synthesize facts that may be presented to you that you may Google or maybe a DBT or something. Um, what then, what importance do you place on actually having a working memorized kind of repository of facts? If and if, if not, likewise, what do you think are the most important types of critical reasoning skills um, to, to just have in your arsenal to work with information. We could meet for dinner sometime and talk about that and a drink. Um, <laughs> um, I, there has to be a factual chronological understanding of history. I mean, you can't do history without knowing facts. I think the, I think maybe the, I think my example of the Edict of Nantes is good. In other words, the names of the three major families in the French Wars of Religion don't make a lot of difference. The fact that the wars went on for over 40 years and there were continual attempts to make peace and finally somebody who had been a Protestant who converted back to Catholicism so he could take the throne, then established um, more religious toleration than in any other country at that point, except maybe the United Netherlands. I think that's important. And then knowing though that absolutism almost a century later came in and then that toleration was taken away. Um, that to me is important because it shows the power of the monarch, the increasing power of the monarch. Um, it shows the, the attempt to control so many aspects of life because, I mean, that's one of the things I could talk about forever is the increasing, no matter what religion you were, no matter where you lived, and I think today we get to this even more, is the increasing um, in what we, I guess the word infringement upon our own autonomy. I mean, look at today. This is one of my big things to students. You just don't have to tell everything that you do and think on, the, on social media. And I'm sure if you're a parent, you worry about that a lot. Um, so when, that, so I, anyway, back to my point, I think that there is a chronological base and I think that you learn the chronology almost through asking the questions about why is it important? I think, why is this, why did this happen? It's really those big questions. Why did this happen? For who, whom did it, for whom uh, was it a benefit? Who was hurt by it? I think those kinds of questions that help you remember the facts. It's that idea that an, beginning to understand what's happening helps then incorporate in your mind what you need to know. Thank you. But I'd rather meet for dinner. Okay.
okay. look for an email from me. Okay. Okay, thank you. And our last question is Eric Estroff. Oh my gosh. Hi, Ms. Smith. Um, I have so much gratitude for you. I, I would go for a really long time, but I have so much gratitude for you and Haley and Pace for organizing this. So thank you so much. This was like so joyous. Um, as a student of history and as a teacher of history, I just had a quick question, which is, as we head into potentially a new chapter of history in a post COVID world, like let's hypothetically say this is a new, new, new chapter. Do you have a challenge for this group of your former students who are potentially in various positions of power um, or influence and, and privilege? What do you, what do you challenge us to think about as we head into this new chapter? Eric, I love that question. I challenge you, first of all, in our country, to think about the basic principles, the civility, the traditions, the norms, the expectations, um, the compromise, the, the fact that there's a higher value than power, whether it's political power or an economic power. There are higher values that are so much more important and that we have a responsibility to think about the generations that are coming next. And I don't think my generation has left you all a really great situation but I think it's become noticeably worse in the last decade or maybe the last three or four decades. I'm not even sure when, but I challenge, I think that's one of my challenges. The, I think the next challenge is to be aware of the humanity of all people. That to me is so important. I mean, you know, if you're a, you know, if you want science, look at our DNA that we share. If you're from the Abrahamic or any religious tradition, um, you know, we're, you know, we're made in the, in the image of God. I mean, this to me is really important. I think I challenge you to look in the future and to, ex and to look what we're doing to this beautiful planet. I mean, I love that picture of the earth from, the, from space where we're just all on this one little ball together. And you guys, we are ruining it. Um, and is that enough, Eric? I think so. Okay. I it. Thank you. Thank you. What a fantastic question to end on. Thank you, Eric, for that thoughtful question. And thank you everyone so much for tuning in and joining us this evening. I know you have other things to get on to, as does Miss Smith. Miss Smith, thank you so much for your time this evening and speaking with all of us and going over all, how everything has changed. I see um, a lot of calls for you to come back and do this again. So we oh, will I'm arrange that to happen for you guys. So keep an eye out and um, just thank you guys so much and have a really good evening. Thank you all. This means so much to me. I really appreciate and love you.